So you look at it, a multi-hour event at least happening in our past. Now we have the wolf here. Now the metabolic rate of a wolf is far faster than what we find in a mastodon. But again, what they're finding in the stomach here is amazing. They have, this thing had just eaten rodents and they were still undigested. Adapt 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift, affecting global crop output, but very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time, cold weather crop losses. Our sun is going through a 400 year cycle, which has the effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2, it's not you, it's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. See, it's back to this. If you don't believe 100% what the narrative says or what the experts quote unquote say, I'm saying it's from the sun. We're getting massive crop losses, just as forecast. Yet it doesn't coteau 100% to the 97% of scientists believe it's CO2. Now, what's most interesting is Al Gore lands in Australia to give advice on climate change. All the while, they're getting record snow and the coldest in 50 years right when he lands. But you know what he says? See, this proves global warming. Oh, no, sorry, climate change. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong word again. Climate extremes. I forgot even what to call. They change it so many times. He says, this proves climate extremes because it's so cold. Remember, we told you that it was going to get record cold and record snow Back in the 90s when we said global warming, oh wait, we had to change it, climate change. Record cold was expected during global warming. You remember we told you that? No, Al, I don't. You never said that. You said my children would never know what snow was. And then you land in a record snowstorm with a record cold in Australia and have the audacity to get off the plane and go, look at all this record cold and snow, it proves climate change. You know, with the cosmic rays increasing, you're going to be looking for these increased volcanic activity. And this has been talked about from John Casey to Willie Soon, Ben, suspicious observers. And everybody in between always talks about the uh, increases in volcanic activity based on cosmic ray increases. That's just a well-known. I mean, this is established science, truly. Like you go out there, there's hundreds and hundreds of peer-reviewed research papers talking about cosmic rays, what they do is excite or they cause bubbling inside silica rich silica glass silica rich magma chambers so remember the magma of earth is not it's not all the same under every volcano that magma is not the same for everyone it's composed of different minerals inside the magma some of them have more of x some of them have more of y some of them have more of z whatever it is but the mineral constituents and combinations inside the magma In some of these oozing volcanoes, that's way different than the explosive volcanoes. You know, there's a difference in the magma. This is a very targeted, very specific type of magma that these cosmic rays affect. It is silica rich. Indonesia would be a good example. Mexico is another good example. A lot of places in South America have this type of magma chamber, silica. A lot of places equatorial, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia bring to mind another few places that have silica-rich magma chambers that are well-known, studied. The increase in volcanic activity is going to be, well, I would say it's going to add into the overall effect. If we're already having cooling conditions and ongoing eruptions, plural, more ash up in the atmosphere, it's definitely going to create some albedo effect and, and cooler conditions. Now, to put this into perspective, When you talk with somebody who definitely believes in global warming, they will tell you that it's evaporating oceans and the evaporating oceans are causing more water vapor in the atmosphere and the more water vapor is now causing heavier snow. 
completely the opposite of what Al Gore told us when he said snow would be a thing of the past, your children won't, won't know what snow is, whatever. But somehow they brainwashed and flipped the brainwashing into snow is guaranteed to be record snow during global warming. Now, you see, that was a 180 switch anyway. Those of you old enough to understand that, you're under, you understand what I'm saying. Like when I grew up, that whole global warming was global warming. It was going to get hotter and hotter and hotter, but it didn't. So then they needed to change it to climate change. And now even with the climate change things about the runaway sea level rises, the runaway melting Arctic ice, which isn't happening, the runaway melting on Greenland, which isn't happening, the ice was gaining after the fourth year in a row. Now they rebranded it as climate extremes, climate extremism, climate extreme. That's a new keyword you need to use, apparently from the BBC. We'll still allow you to use the words climate change, but you're supposed to shift over. Didn't you get the memo? Anyway, so when you talk about this, the reason that some places are going into a mega drought is the jet streams are moving across the planet and locking into new places. And with it, carrying moisture away from places or bringing moisture to other places. So it's got to move. If it moves somewhere, it's going to take away from another place. Now, I understand geoengineering and all these other things happening at the same time. But I'm saying there's a massive shift currently in the way that the the cloud and moisture bands across the planet are moving more north in some places and they're being pushed more south in the southern hemisphere. This is a direct result of that. When you see a 5x increase in snowfall, this is a moisture band being pushed. But the global warming advocates would say the warming oceans are causing this. But what you need to do is draw them back to 1998 and 99 when we had the biggest, heaviest El Nino and the temperatures were one-tenth of a degree cooler than today on the El Nino peak. So if evaporating oceans and heating were really driving all the moisture as claimed with the global warming crowd, then we should have seen this same kind of tripling of snowfall across the same ranges that we're seeing now in 1998 and nine, but we didn't. So the causation there to say, hey, evaporating oceans, great, but we should see the same result regardless of time period. And speaking of cycles, my new book with my co-author Bill Porter, Climate Revolution, a must-read for understanding our sun-driven climate. As we progress deeper into this new eddy grand solar minimum, weather extremes leading to global food scarcity and higher food prices are here now. This book describes the expected changes, how to survive and thrive during future challenging times, and also practical preparations the entire book is interactive with over 250 links so you can click and go out to the scientific aspect of what we're talking about with the repeating cycles in this grand solar minimum. The science is explained so you understand the mechanisms. The solutions are there because we know we're going to face these exact same problems again that were faced in the Maunder minimum, the Sporer minimum, the Wolf minimum. Find designs for building greenhouses, grow guides, Beam soil techniques as well as bioreactors to create your own growth hormones for the soil. Available now, the new ADAPT 2030 Climate Revolution. The link's in the description box below. What's the end game here? We're coming into the most tumultuous time for food growing experience in the last multi-centuries on our planet here. Your food prices are going to start rising. And by Christmas, you will absolutely look back on this and say, wow. That was a crystal ball. Six months from now, the world we're entering will be a little bit different from what you know now. By 2021, at the end of Christmas 2021, we will be in an entirely different world where you might not recognize it because food's going to be that expensive. Because what we were expecting and anticipating in terms of food crop losses, what you're seeing this year was expected in 2021, not now. So you got eight of the brightest minds on the planet looking into this whole solar cycle thing on how it interrupts food production globally going back 4,500 or 6,500 years. So that means that our timeline has sped up. So it was expected in 2022, 23, 24, when it was going to get, we were predicting massive food losses in 23, 24. That's going to be rolled up here to 21. So now we've got a Pleistocene unearthed wolf completely intact. That's crazy how... When you look at the pictures here, you're going to say, what? That thing died yesterday. 
So the same the exact thing. This animal here got caught in that same exact event. So what is it in our geologic past that makes the media tell us that everything is so stable? And what is going on with repeating history here that could repeat right now? Now they found three cave lions, the same team here that was uh, excavating and found this wolf also found three lions. They weren't very big, but they were flash frozen as well. So doing all these MRIs on there to see exactly what happened with these animals. But then, you know, you look around the planet here and you see a lot of petroglyphs and different types of uh, civilizations in the past that have left etchings for us to discover and see something in the skies. And they were living underground, no bones about it. Which brings me to my next story here. If we head over to Turkey, they've just discovered a new underground city. It's a new 5,000 year old underground city in Cappadocia. Now, I've personally been, I've been to Cappadocia and Gorame in, in Turkey way back in the 90s, way before any of the problems with all the Middle East and all the wars and everything. This was like a peaceful time. I traveled by bus. People were very incredibly friendly. They were so interested in American culture. And I'll tell you a story. I was on a bus. <laughs> I got to, I'll, I'll wind this up here for you. I was on a bus and I was going out to this place called Gorame. And I was in Istanbul and it's like a five hour, five and a half hour bus ride. It's probably faster now because the roads are better because it's in the mid 1990s. So I'm on the bus, and I'm the only foreign guy on the bus. But there's a few guys who spoke English in there, and they're like, hey, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from the States. I'm traveling. I'm going back home. I just spent time in Jordan, and I was down in, in, uh, in Egypt, and I was, I'm really interested in ancient history, and I really like what you have in your culture here, and I'm super interested in Gorame, Cappadocia, because it's part of the oldest history on our planet. I wanted to go out and check it out. People were really interested in the American culture, and I'll never forget the conversation we had. They were like, how did you pay for your trip? Like, how long did it take you to save up the money? I saved up for a whole year, and now I'm coming to travel for a whole year. So I, I work for one year, and then I travel for a year. And they were like, really? Why would you give up your job? And I said, well, it's easy. You just go back and you find another job. And they were dumbfounded, like, what? It's so difficult to find work here. When you get a job, you hold that thing so tight you never let go. And you're talking about just giving up a job and whooshing around the planet and then coming back and getting another job. Like for them, that blew their mind that it was so easy to find work. But then secondly, one guy was really into cars. He didn't speak any English, but he was translating through his friend. He's super into cars. He wanted to buy a car. He's like, man, I have a car. It's like the, the whip, you know, here in, in Turkey. You got a car. You got it made, man. You'd... So we were talking about cars. And I said, yeah, you know what? Part of my money is because I sold my car, too, to get some money to travel. So then the guy's like, you sold your car. Oh, my gosh, you're never getting another car. And I go, no, same thing, man. You just, I'll just rock back in, and as soon as I get another job, I'll, I'll get another car. And this guy just fell on the floor like, what? It takes us like half a lifetime to get enough money to buy a car. And here you are saying you just rock in it, and you get a job, and then you just jump out for a year because you want to go travel because you can get another job. You had a car. You sold it because you need the money for traveling. You're going to go back and just buy another car like it's like buying a piece of fruit. <laughs> and they were floored on the American culture that it was that easy to find work in the 90s. And then you could buy a car so quickly and sell it. All oh, these guys were, they were super fun to hang with. So they were going out of Cappadocia too. So then they ended up taking me out. One of the friends was having a wedding. So it was at a public place anyway. And there's these big hearth, like fireplace going, raging, and everybody was there. There was no alcohol going on at the party, by the way. It was purely, you know, tea and different kind of beverages. Yeah, I had the greatest time. I had these rice wrapped in these vine leaves, like, you know, vines. So you grow grapevine leaves and just... Really amazing people, super welcoming. One of my favorite countries I've ever traveled in. It was just, the people were outstanding there. The culture was amazing. The history was just mind-blowing. And it truly was living in a dream walking through there. Everything was so opulent. Istanbul, the markets, the brass markets, and the spice market. And whoa, it's, and the fabrics and everything draping over these clay walls. And whoo. And then in the market, in the brass market, it was all, ah. Everything glowed and sparkled. And it was people smoking shishas, not, not hash or anything, but regular shishas and the apple shisha. And the, they had, what else did they have? The peach and the apple I liked the best. They had peach and a, f a few other flavors. Truly, it was the most amazing with modern infrastructure mixed with the old world. Like you're stepping into a time machine of two worlds mixed together of 2,000 years still exists within the modern infrastructure. So this is still way pre-internet time or like a limited small internet. So I went to Cappadocia, went to Gourmet. The hotel down there is a cave. Like you stay in a cave hotel because it's the exact same cities that they carved out of here. 
Now the the rock to work there is super easy to work. Like you can cut it real easy, and it's not that you would you could as a Stone Age person dig in and create a home inside this stuff. Incredibly beautiful rocks. Everything's got these pinks and purples and you know really light colors in it, and it's striated. And wow, you're looking at this magical land. When you crest the hill, you're like, whoa, what is this place? He's got houses in all the hills. You got all these holes and like oval indentations in. Lots of people cut their homes in the sides of the hills. Like everything's an underground. It's a full underground civilization working in modern day there. Now, of course, they have buildings on the outside. But when I went there, half of the infrastructure was carved out of the hills still working. So when I found this next story here, mysterious flooding leads to discovery of a 5,000-year-old underground city in Turkey's Cappadocia region. I thought another one, interesting, because I'd gone to a couple of the underground cities that were already open in the 90s where you could jump around in super, super tiny, narrow passageways, me being a taller guy over six feet, not comfortable, not comfortable at all. I I didn't feel really like claustrophobic down in there. It was very wide open, but I felt like I couldn't walk around. You had to hunch over everywhere. Same in Egypt. When you went down into the pyramid and stuff, you got to hunch over. This pyramid entry is like three feet tall. But they're finding another full, a full-on city. Now, a lot of people, locals, knew it was there. Some kids had fallen in. Some homes had collapsed into this thing. They talk about kids playing in it when they were younger, and they used to go down in and, and find stuff and bring it out. And it was probably sold a long time ago. There was massive flooding that kept flooding people's homes, and they couldn't figure out where all this water was coming from. It was clear water, so obviously it wasn't sewage water. So they had the whole neighborhood flooding, and nobody could figure out where all this water was coming from. It was seeping into the homes. It was like flooding all these homes. So then they called the engineers in, and then they traced back the source to a river that has recently broken open and started flooding out of this city. So some geologic change in the Cappadocia region is now forcing water into a new area to push out and flood through the underground city and then exit out from the underground city. It's like spring-fed water that's emerging out of here. This city is actually 80 kilometers from those other, that other city that I go in the underground city that had enough space for 5,000 people under there. Kamakali, that wasn't open yet, but they were talked about that was a newfound city back in the 90s when I was there. But this new city that they just found recently here that they do now want to open and figure out how to do it is 1.2 million square meters underground. It's over two kilometers in size underground, which brings me to the point of what were they running from? And it was not invasion because the way the air ducts are, and and, and there in Yinku as well, the air ducts, any invading army could just cover over. Like it wasn't to escape an invading army like they say, because the air ducts and the air inflows were easily blockable. So any invading army, all they would have had to do was block up the air ducts and they would have driven them out of their hiding space. It was too easy. They never would have done that. And this is the same exact thing here. So you got three underground cities, each of them more than square kilometers underground for habitation of not only humans, but animals, cooking, sewage, everything. So what, what did they set up to run from? What were they hiding from? And the dolmens as well. And like the dolmens, you got to take a look at these little small stone structures across the planet. There were millions of these dolmens. A lot of them have been used for road construction, building construction, etc. nowadays, but there used to be millions of dolmens, so that was like an individual shelter, if you will. So you got the big city shelters here, and then you had the dolmens, which are the individual shelter or enough for two to three people for a short period of time. What were they hiding from coming from our skies? And then we come to the desert southwest, and we have all the cliff dwellers And you go over into China and you find cliff dwellings as well everywhere. Underground cities, cliff dwellings all through China. Middle East, I went to a place called Petra up in Jordan. Same trip when I was going to this Cappadocia, etc. We'd gone to Jordan and Petra and camped out in the Wadiram Desert. Couldn't do that now. You'd be kidnapped for sure. But back then, 1990s, way before the wars, Jordan was completely stable, very peaceful, fun to... Again, Jordan was like a great time to travel Amazing food, incredibly friendly people. Everything was top notch, like five star, you know, Arab living everywhere you went. And I tell you what, that was some of the best travel experiences I had in my life was going through the Middle East like that. But back then, incredible. Jordan and Petra, 
you know, Petra, you, you think it's that famous Indiana Jones temple. They have the one treasury where you go in. That's kind of the most famous building under there is that treasury. Okay, that's one out of thousands of buildings under there. They have Roman amphitheater, cathedrals, and so all kind of stuff. Roman amphitheater is crazy. It's at the end of the valley, and it takes up the where's stone columns, and it's, wow. And then inside there, too, you find the exact same thing. Thousands and thousands of areas and cliffs where they dug out. Now, this is pure sandstone, but they had some crazy colored sandstone. Purples, reds, oranges, really striated colored sandstones in there, just like Cappadocia with the pinks and the purples. And What were they all hiding from? The cliff dwellers, what were they hiding from in the desert southwest? Like what went on in our geologic past? And we got these frozen animals. And we got a majority of the world's population living underground for at least a portion just a few thousand years ago. So what they're telling you about the stability of our climate is a myth in itself. Like our climate has not been stable. If you got full underground cities, all these dolmens and across every continent, everywhere you look, just a mere few thousand years ago, we got the cave paintings and we got the cave art and we got the petroglyphs everywhere showing massive, massive plasma discharges on our planet from space. This would explain the frozen animals. And if we're coming back into a time again in a cycle, then we could expect some of these same phenomenon. And what about 5G? I mean, where are you going to run from 5G Wi-Fi signal? If it's coming from satellites and it's coming from ground-based towers, you're going to have to go underground again if you're going to try to remove yourself from the 5G signal range. So why is it our Earth? Mother Earth is our protector again. And it comes back to these myths and legends. Mother Earth is our protector. Because that is the only thing that knocks down 5G signal. And it's the only thing that you can hide from, from plasma discharge, space lightning, 300, 500 mile an hour, you know, sideline winds, massive hailstorms. I don't care how big the hail is. Even if it's a hundred pound hail, you're still going to be safe underground in a city like that. In a dolmen as well. Why are they so afraid to tell us about our geologic past in these history books? Why does everything have to be so stable and linear? TrueLeafMarket.com. I really want to talk about growing your own food, which will be a necessity moving forward. There's so many ways that we can go about growing different types of vegetables that we're going to need. You know, microgreens are incredibly nutritious. They're super fast to grow. In less than a week, you can have something that you can eat. Also, sprouts. We can get those a little bit taller, a little more dense, a little bit larger volume on the vegetation mass coming off of there. So how do you know what kind of sprouts to grow? How about wheatgrass or herbs? What about different types of herbs that we can add to our foods? Now, what I just described to you, there's a full range of starter guides there at trueleafmarket.com for you to take a look at. Even if it's just for your own knowledge and you don't purchase something from them, at least get the information so you know how to grow microgreens, you know how to grow sprouts, you understand what some of the herbs are for. Trueleafmarket.com. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. We started as hunter-gatherers. Everything was stable. We moved from place to place while everything was stable. And then we got into bigger cities and we started to have bigger habitations while everything was stable. And then we started to know how to grow food when everything was stable. And then we'd learn how to grow food and store it and then trade it when everything was stable. And it's been stable the whole time. And you see how we progressed from a hunter-gatherer in completely stable conditions all the way until today. It's stable. Everything's fine. Don't look back 400 years. Don't look back 5,000 years. Just it's all been good, smooth, man, smooth, dude. And that's the exact story that you get from the history books. But in reality, we get a completely different picture. So what is it? Is it just that they're trying to control us on this planet to try to keep us thinking that things will be stable so we look to the future for everything? We don't really look at now. Like I don't know that many people that enjoy the now. I try to. You know, this whole Grand Solar Minimum awareness thing for me is making me enjoy the moment more. Because I know in a few years that our world's going to shift. So every moment I have in this world, I'm more savoring. Like just the ease of getting around, the ease of buying stuff, the ease of being alive now. And having these things at your fingertips, I savor it even more. I tell you what, you got to start being so appreciative for what you have. Like my girlfriend and myself, we went out and got a bottle of wine and I was holding the bottle and I was like clutching it next to my chest going, oh, I'm so thankful for this. 
I don't know if we're going to get this in five or ten years from now. I would even say five. I'm so happy we have this. Look how easy this was to get. Somebody else got this wine to us. Like in the future, we're going to have to grow it ourselves, put it in our own oak barrels and try to do it ourselves, even if we have the skill to get an oak barrel. But what if we're using the time to try to grow food so we can stay alive? That's what I was thinking. Just enjoying the wine too was like, got this right now. And anything we have, you know, cheese. I was so excited about having the cheese during that night too. And the, the chicken and the olives. Cheesecake. So thankful for what I have right now. Everything. The ease that we can get it. Because if history is repeating, and what I see in these rainfall pattern repeats of either a 2,000 or a 6,000 year cycle, what scares me is if it is truly a mid-Holocene 6,000 year cycle, we're going to need to go back to these cities to live underground to live through this. A 2,000 year cycle would be tumultuous enough because you can look through the last 2,000 years of history and see collapse of empires, collapse of dynasties, collapse of fiefdoms, kingdoms, and the list goes on and on. Population declines in the whole nine yards just in the last 2,000 years. But the last 6,000 years takes us into a whole league up, an entire pro league reset. What we're going to go through in a 2,000 year reset is a minor league reset. If you are lucky enough to only get a 400 year reset, that would be a blessing because the way things are falling out right now and the quickness that they're happening indicates that it's a much more powerful cycle. And see, that's all about the food because we can't grow enough food and we can't produce enough food to distribute like we do these days. Our society is going to stop functioning, period. Hungry people, hey, you're going to have to try to control them. They're going to be unruly anyway. They're going to want change. Let them eat cake. French Revolution is a perfect example of not having enough food to feed a culture. The decline of the Ming Dynasty. They didn't go quietly into the night. They went quietly into revolution because they couldn't get enough food. And you see it time and time again. When you can't feed the people, they get angry. So a majority of resources that we could be used for food growing and trying to reestablish our society and get people up into organized communities to grow food is going to be spent and wasted on trying to control people who are angry because they don't have food. See, that's we get into this feedback loop and then we got the wasted resources. But, you know, these wasted resources a little bit irk me because we could, the governments could be warning us right now. I mean, this time today, these weeks, they could be telling us what's happening to get us organized and giving us resources so we could have better facilities to store what we grow locally and process it locally. But they keep stringing it along as long as they can to make, I don't know, I'm thinking they're looking for the most damage they can possibly get out of this event on a natural cycle. Then they say, well, it's not us. We're not culpable. Damn, we didn't know that this, we thought the science was settled, man. It's not settled. Sorry. We learned. Like how many times in history do you hear that same thing? Oops, we didn't know. You have to be very cognizant of your surroundings around 2023 and the shifts that are going on. And it begins now. It's already begun. And I encourage you to do your own research. And again, tonight's broadcast, I don't want you to believe me. It's not the point. The point is to show something and then you go do your own research so you can try to back it up or call me out, whatever you want to do. Got rainbow colored clouds over Virginia. You got fire rainbows over Pennsylvania. You got circum horizontal arc clouds over Ontario all on the same day. So like what's happening in the atmosphere that's causing these visible anomalies now from Canada down to the southern part of the United States? I'm just dropping you a couple breadcrumbs here to follow along. And who's going to be left after all this? Chaos. Is this one giant program to get the smartest people who are aware of all this, to get the preparation people to get through all these times? What if it all is because there's too many people on the planet, but who's going to survive through this? Who do they want on the back end? Like if you had to choose right now, there's 7 billion people on the planet and I'm only going to let through a billion. But that new billion is going to reform the new society because we have reached the end of everything. The debt cycle, the credit cycle, the population cycle, every cycle is at the end. It's run its course. So anyway, we're just going to let everything naturally occur, keep everybody uninformed. Who's going to form our new society? So who would you want with you on the backside? Would you want a bunch of people who just watch TV and consume junk food and then do nothing? Or would you, would you want somebody who actually took action to prepare themselves, store their food, learn all these skill sets, learn how to grow things, prepare things, repair things? And if they see the truth through the lies, they're going to start getting ready on their own. 
This video is brought to you by our friends at trueleafmarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet, 